The Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports in association with Cadbury. A player and a half deserves a glass and a half of support. Lily I scores one of the most important goals they have ever scored. What a moment for the Republic of Ireland. Hello and welcome to the episode of Koi Gig, which we have been dreaming about recording for the last year, pretty much at this stage. Um, on- year. Year. <laughs> try 30. Try 30 years. Well, I mean, Emma, I was going to just throw, uh, you were, it literally interrupted me as I was just about to say, we've been doing this for a year, but I know yourself and Karen have been on this track for a whole lot longer. So, I mean, I was in tears last night watching the match and I had felt sick for about three days beforehand. So I cannot imagine how the two of you guys felt. Emma, you were there. What what was that like? I mean, anyone who's listening to Off the Ball last night probably heard your commentary <laughs> and how excited you were. <laughs> it all went out the window at one stage. I was I I just didn't speak for like nearly three minutes, like especially the last six minutes. I couldn't speak because I was just like I wasn't breathing, <laughs> and, and I actually felt physically sick. I thought I was going to actually puke because I was so nervous. And thank God Nathan was there to to carry on because it was just incredible. You know, the start of the, the game, when I, I, I drove up there, so when I pulled into the car park, I actually had to check the venue again because there was there wasn't a car there. There was nobody outside the stadium. The stadium was dark. I was like, what the hell is going on here like this is the biggest game for us but it's also the biggest game for you Scotland and the Scottish FA have done absolutely nothing to you know not to promote the game I don't know what they did before but certainly the day of the game there was no buzz there was no atmosphere you know like at Tallis Stadium we have the pre-game stuff outside and all the kids are there it's kind of cool I would have no problem pulling up to that stadium in a team coach because it looked completely dead and that would have just given me an extra motivation. So I felt actually a bit sorry for the Scottish um, women players because I feel like there wasn't enough done for them. But I wasn't worried about that at the time. Well, when I got into the stadium and then they were practicing the national anthems and stuff like that and the players started coming out into the pitch, I just got really nervous. Like I don't get nervous for games or I didn't when I was playing and I was the most nervous I have ever been for a football match in my life. Um, and it was just Probably crazy. It's a lot harder as well when you're not on the pitch, when you're just sitting there watching and knowing you can't do anything. Everything has been done. You just have to endure the 96 minutes. Yeah. And, you know, it was just brilliant the way we started. I, I said it to Nathan. I don't know if I said it on here or off. I don't know when I was on, when I was off, which can be dangerous. I was like, listen, if we don't start well, we are going to lose. And I said, that is it, because Scotland want to come at us. If they come at us from the beginning and we sit off and we go into our shell, we're going to lose. And that's it. And we started so well. And I was just buzzing. I was absolutely buzzing because of that. Yeah, I'd love to know the amount of interceptions that Denise and blocks Denise made in the first 10 minutes because she was just up everyone's arses like it was <laughs> fast. But I was the exact same as you, Emma, like because the Champions League ran over on RT, I was actually blessed because before the game, I couldn't speak. I've never been so nervous. I was watching anything because they had the commentary on in the place. I watched it in a pub and they had you speaking. And I had this like ginormous screen in front of me with just your face. And I could just tell looking at you and the way you were speaking. I was like, that's the most nervous I've ever seen. Yeah, I was cotton mouth. Like I'd, I'd, I'd lost all thoughts. I mean, we've analysed everything to death over the course of the campaign, but this wasn't about happened to do it football it was just so big it was it was too big I couldn't handle it to be honest we won't even get into what I was like after the game but yeah it was it was insane but that that start of the game yeah it did settle us and then we then we had a few hairy moments about 13 minutes in I was gonna say we won't mention the the incident at the start of the game just yet we'll we'll revel in the fun for a bit longer um yeah no like when I left the pub after the game I kind of walked outside and I was like on Stephen's green And everyone was just kind of going about their business. And I was like, why are people dancing in the streets? Like, did I just dream that this just happened? It seems so bizarre. And when I went home, I couldn't sleep for like two or three hours because I was just lying in bed like, we actually did it. We're going to a World Cup. (laughs) Yeah, and it was brilliant. And then afterwards as well, it's just, it was the first time I actually felt like we've, 
taken that step further because even in the previous games, everybody was celebrating when we play when we beat Slovakia. Um, but I wasn't because I was like, we're not there yet. We're nowhere near it. This is another game. It's like as if we have another qualifying phase to get through. Mm. And um, a couple of the girls were feeling the same way as well. So I was like, maybe it's just me. But then when they confirmed it, I was like, yeah, well, like there's nothing to celebrate yet. But last night was the first time. And I just felt like everything just washed over me. I must have had, nobody has ever told me this, but I must have had a built up frustration and nearly bitterness towards football that just disappeared last night when we won. It was just so good. It was such a good feeling. Ashley O'Reilly had a great video of Katie running over to you um, and just like jumping into your arms, practically bouncing over the barrier that was between the <laughs> two of you. <laughs> and it seemed to be a lot of the players on the night were like quite... I don't know, they just seemed that they wanted to share that moment with as many people who had experienced that international setup and all the like heartbreak that had come before. Well, that's it, isn't it, Caro? They, they, we were all together through those horrific years, yeah. horrific years of playing and trying to qualify. And it has been a hard, bloody slog. Like, well, for me, 23 years trying to do it. But it's not only that, it's it's not it's not the fact that we haven't qualified. It's going into the dressing room, sitting around the English, the Scottish, uh, the, the Spanish, the, the French, all the other nations in your dressing room. Talk, and they're talking about World Cup. They're talking about Euros. They're talking and then they're talking about us not qualifying. And we're kind of the, the butt of the joke and, and having to laugh along with it. And it's just that's what I felt last night. I was like, no more. We're going to they can go into those dressing rooms and saying we've qualified. And now those all of those names that people didn't know, the likes of Heather Payne, Amber Barrett, obviously managers are going to be looking at them, which I think is the best thing of it. Mm -hmm. Managers and coaches are going to be asking other coaches, what about this player? And they're going to be Irish names. And I can't wait to see that. And how like. When the game actually finished and everything kind of like settled for you, Karen, like what was the overwhelming emotion when you'd kind of like you'd left RT, left studio, went home? I don't know what you did, had a pint. I, of I lie on the floor and I cried. <laughs> so I had to like kind of keep it together for the post match um, a little bit. But yeah, I think it was that just release of emotion. There's been so much, maybe, I don't know, we had this kind of a little bit of bitterness when we were going into those qualifying campaigns. I mean, we always tried our best and believed that we could compete, but the odds were stacked against us and to have to go asking for more training and things like that. The fact that that's all gone away and it's kind of just come full circle now where the, the girls are all professionals and it just shows what a little bit of investment could do. So it was just kind of like, God, imagine what if we'd done this 10 years ago, but then it's also the excitement of what it's going to do going forward. And it was just that range of emotions between just pride and jealousy to an extent as well. <laughs> and like, I mean, just so happy for the girls, particularly like I'm looking at Neve Fahey, who was putting her body on the line. She was player of the match. Yeah, she contended with so much. I mean, injury wise and different managers she's seen as well over the years and just everything. And honestly, it was a great save in the end. I mean, that that handball probably saved just the game. The I end told the game. her she should I, speak to Gat she years scored, ago. She scored <laughs> from a handball this year and she possibly got us to the World Cup with the defensive handball. So um, yeah. the likes of her and Anya O'Gorman, the amount of meetings and stuff that Anya went through and to try and drive those better standards five years ago. There's a lot of mention of that, but for them to just be able to enjoy the moment, I think, and stop talking about that now. And yeah. Look forward. I'm sure they're sick of the same line of question. And, and it's just a lot of sacrifice has gone into the team. Um, I was saying it last night as well, the girls who've all moved abroad to become professional because we still have a long way to go in this country. I mean, some of them are playing second division here and there and over Europe and they're not making their millions. And, that's a huge step and it was one that I wasn't willing to make and these girls have done it for the betterment of the Irish team and I just think a huge, huge kudos needs to go for them for that because that's what's going to bring on football in this country, their kind of sacrifices and stuff. 
And have you noticed much of, because uh, I know I saw, I think it was Ivan Nikon and a couple of other people tweeting this morning that they were getting like loads of messages in asking, where's the nearest girls academy or like, where's the nearest club to me? And have you noticed that that bounce is kind of already happening with people yeah. being interested in like, how do we get involved in PMAT? How do we get our daughter? I, I don't know. I'm just reading all the tweets and starting crying again. So can't really see too much or what's mm-hmm. going on, but I'm sure it is. I mean, my Twitter feed is nothing but... Irish women's at the moment um, and that's unbelievable to see um, so that's only the start of it now and um, now is the time that they need to capitalise on it and it's a bigger conversation where the league in Ireland is going to go or are they going to start looking now straight away to go semi-professional and then, then there's comparisons to when the men made their first World Cup and how it wasn't capitalised on by the League of Ireland here and to learn from those mistakes and that's all a big very long complicated conversation to have I kind of just want to focus on just the squad that's there at the moment and and letting them enjoy what they've done and and let the conversation start maybe next week because yeah it's just it's great to see all their posts and all the joy and seeing all their families and stuff in the crowds it's it was emotional yeah well I love the fact that I think the top performing piece of content out of last night there wasn't like on off the ball it wasn't us winning it wasn't the post-match interview with Vera or Amber and then it was a post-match interview with Lauren McCabe and <laughs> <laughs> everyone was just loving it I was looking at the stats this morning I think it has like 30 40,000 views or something and everyone was just like it's a mini Katie <laughs> <laughs> yeah that set me off again I was like oh this is cute there's Rusha and then I was looking at it, I was like <laughs> the bottom lip <laughs> started to go again so I was like moving on <laughs> swipe up swipe up yeah it was very sweet and um, she is a mini Katie isn't she yeah, and apparently quality. mini mini Katie on the pitch yeah as well so that's good we're going to have another Katie we need um to, to start trying to reproduce more Katie's because she, yeah. she was just incredible, wasn't she, last night? Up and After, down yeah. the line. I mean, drawing free kicks when we were under so much pressure and then those balls that she was putting into the box. I mean, our chances were better than the Scottish chances and they were kind of all coming from from that. Obviously, the throw-ins were... <laughs> the throw in Consternation as well in there. The throw-in, she... Katie put the fear of God in in their whole right hand side. In fact, um, Pedro, the Scottish manager, call him Pedro now, you know, um, Pedro changed the team for Katie. So he he took Cleland off and he put Fiona Brown in, and it was it wasn't a, a great decision. And then of course you have Lisa Evans playing right back, who would be one of the WSL's better players. And she had a bit of a torrid night, and I think she'd admit that herself. So I mean that well, that whole side was substituted at the end when they were going for the win. So it just goes to show that they were run ragged. Yeah. And someone who would know Katie quite well, like I know that she put in a few tackles to her, and Katie was kind of smiling at her as she was getting up. She had seen those in her time in Arsenal. Um, well, I was actually at the hotel this morning to see some of the players and we have an interview with Anya O'Gorman for you guys, a special little Koi gig exclusive. Uh, and we will be back right after this with some more analysis. Um, so you obviously hadn't played for quite a while for the national side. What was that like when you were told and you realised you were going to be on the starting of that? Like, did you know in the lead up to the match? Um, not really. Obviously, I haven't played a competitive game since November last year. Um, yeah, so only a couple of days before the match, I kind of got an inkling um, that I'd be involved. But I always said that I was there for the team and ready when, when I'm needed. Um, and look, uh, just one of them players that's going to focus on training and do what I can in training to try to get in the team. And luckily, the hard work paid off. And did Vera say anything to you about like why she had picked you after that amount of time? Um, not really. Like I think she just kept it short and sweet. Like you're st- getting in, getting the game plan. She knew I'd be defensively solid. I like to make runs forward, um, score goals. Should have scored a goal, but look, it doesn't matter. Amber Brown put the ball in the back of the net. Courtney saved the penalty. Um, yeah. So look, for me then it was just to focus on my task, stick to my task, go out and relish the the opportunity. Um, to play in such a big game and um, just delighted we got the result. And were you able to enjoy it at any stage or was it just like I presume whenever the final whistle went there was the obvious elation but was there any stage during the match like even after Amber scored where you were like oh we might actually do this? Yeah look Vera told us at half time that Portugal had beaten Iceland I think it was 4-1 so at that moment I was like 
we win now we're going to qualify straight to World Cup not that it affected the outcome of what we had to do either way we had to, to win the game to go to the Intercontinental Tournament or straight to the World Cup but obviously <coughs> that one moment in the second half I think we were a little bit under the cosh but look we love absorbing that pressure I think we enjoy it bodies on the line heading balls booting balls until I seen the six minutes on the clock um, at a time but look we managed to see the game out and, and what a moment I mean, I was tired just watching it from jumping up and down and screaming, so I can't imagine how you guys felt in general. <laughs> and I read an interview with you where you said, you know, the Ukraine match, what that, like how it lasted with you, how it stayed, and you weren't sure if there was anything that was ever going to replace it. Do you think this might be the moment that comes to the forefront of your mind? Yeah, definitely. I think, obviously, that's still going to live with me forever, but I think we learned a lot from that game and a lot in them high-pressure situations. Obviously, it was a big setback for me personally and the team. But look how we've reacted and how we've grown and gone from strength to strength. Even with the players who are missing through injury, we were carrying them on the pitch last night. And it just, just shows the big squad efforts, the backroom staff, the players, and what a special group it is. Because that has kind of been all the talk this week in the lead up is mentality and how I, you can easily see the growth in the squad over the last couple of years. What for you was the moment where things maybe clicked a bit and you were like, oh, mentally we're in such a different space and we're we're going to do this we're we're a lot better um i think obviously after the equal pay deal um and then we played australia in a friendly and then from them i think we really kicked on obviously we played sweden in the first game of the campaign at home lost one nil put in a good performance we're probably a little bit unlucky towards the end went way to finland got that 2-1 result i think from them we've just kicked on and obviously this is great we've won we're going to the world cup but there is also the domestic stuff still ongoing how are you feeling about the end of the season yeah look i think it's amazing the position that obviously p mount are in at the moment there's four teams in the in the title race and um, look it's exciting and i think it's great for the, the league at home and i listen to karen duggan every week telling me about how <laughs> sore her legs are I don't mind her. <laughs> and for the league in general, I mean, we talk about it quite a lot on Koigig about the the aim of going semi-pro and having that opportunity. What do you think this win does for that conversation? Look, I think that's just around the corner. Um, clubs in the country go on semi-pro and I think that the women's national league clubs need to piggyback on the success of the Irish, uh, the women's national team as well. So, um, look, I think the future's bright and I'd love to see the league go on from strength to strength. Um, So we've done a lot of talk about how we felt during the game and how entertaining it was by when it actually was over and you could kind of soak it in a little bit more and not so much when it was on. I think I watched most of it like this. Um, Mm -hmm. But for you guys, standout players, obviously Amber Barrett got woman of the match from Orti. I thought Courtney Brosnan put in a particularly good performance. I know you've mentioned one or two players there, but who, who stood out for you? I, well, I, you have to mention Courtney, don't we? Yeah, we yeah. have to mention Courtney for that penalty save. And, you know, there's certain at a certain level, there's key moments in the game which are crucial. They can you can win or lose in those key moments. And that penalty save was definitely up there as one of the, the biggest moments. But for me, I can't stop talking about Nifahi from last night just because simply, you know, she came back from injury. Neve's always questioning herself you know can she do better in games she's always analyzing herself so she's very conscious of her own performance and I'm just so happy for her because she needed that more than anything and I thought she was absolutely top drawer so for me yeah, I mean anyone asked me who my favorite player I've ever played with is it's Neve because of what the sense of calm she just brings to a team and you saw when Courtney maybe tactically took that little break um, in the middle of the second half uh, Neve was over there driving the girls on being the leader that she is and, and yeah like that she's seen it all done it all and she's still going strong and getting to to levels that have brought us to a World Cup I mean Katie and Denise will always get the plaudits and, and obviously Louise Quinn chips in with her goals as well but the difference it makes on an occasion like that to keep the back line and the midfield in front of her from getting overwhelmed and overrun. Like you can't, she's like a coach on the pitch. Um, so yeah, I definitely herself, I think the work rate, the two girls put in on the wings and Heather up front again, I'd say the GPSs were on fire. Um, and I mean, Denise, always Denise, like, mm-hmm. I mean, the strength, it's her strength and her defense. Yeah. Her defensive qualities, 
need to be studied as well because she is so strong on the ball um, her body shape for when she picked up that ball from Neve's header for the goal was perfect. The pace on the ball. Oh, the pass was just first touch. sublime. Like you yeah. watch the pass alone and you're like, that has to be a goal. That pass yeah. just deserves Listen, a goal. I was talking to some of the Scottish players and um, they didn't say anything. They didn't give out in a way, but I could tell that they were going to try to win it in midfield. They thought they were going to win it in midfield. They thought with their um, Kaka, uh, Caroline Weir and Erin Cuthbert in their world-class players, they thought that was where they were going to win it and they weren't really worried. Lily Ag and Denise O'Sullivan from minute one absolutely bossed that midfield and absolutely shunned Erin Cuthbert and, and Caroline Weir. They were not in the game. They completely marked them out of the game. I think it's not, I'm not going to say a, the worst performance from them, but they'll certainly be very disappointed because they didn't even look like they're the type of player they can be. Well, and that's uh, our midfield. Yeah, well, that was one of the things I wanted to ask you guys because I feel like a lot of the analysis today has been about how good we were, but no one has actually looked at Scotland and said like, well, what did go wrong there? Because, I mean, they went in heavy favorites compared I mean I always thought it wasn't as heavy as some places were making it out to be but they just didn't seem to really be there and like they had talked so much in the lead up to it about their mentality and how much that had changed but they seemed nervous or something on the pitch like they just didn't seem to well, settle in I, I think that's down to what Emma said the midfield battle because they thought Cuthbert and Weir can dominate a game and then then they'll set up chances for their more forward players. But when they weren't having as a free time on the ball, they were going long and off a lot. And we play five at the back. Like that's long ball into girls who were fantastic at headers of the ball played into our hands. Um, they never once got in behind us apart from the potential second penalty. But we <laughs> we learned. I don't know what you're talking about, Karen. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the spaces were just condensed for them to play in. So, um, yeah, I just thought they looked devoid of kind of any flair once we had those banks up in front of them. They they weren't able to pull us out of position in any way. No, but it was shocking. It was pretty shocking from them. I mean, they must have woken up this morning and thought they'd been hit by a bus because it... For me, it was like, what the what the hell is happening here? They have no plan B. They're I mean, at the end, it. how many square passes to the centre backs play to each other in Just the crazy. seventh to the sixth minute? Yeah, they had no Four plan B. The plan no. A was to get on the ball in midfield and to put a diagonal ball behind into our channel. They tried to do that every single time and it didn't work. It didn't work for them not once. And I was like, you have to change it. If that's not working, you play to feet. I know we were condensed, but move the ball quicker. They weren't moving the ball. Plus, we're looking at a Scotland v Ireland. You expect it to be physical. Ireland are going in there and they're already like, you know, sharpening their elbows. Scotland didn't come out. They, they didn't even try to be physical. They tried to be the, the football and team. You need to win that game. You need to be physical. You're playing against Ireland. It's a very personal game as well. And there was no there was no fight in there. That's the one thing I was disappointed. I was looking for a really physical, scrappy, feisty game. And we were the only feisty ones. And and that suited us down to a T. I did think it was strange what you say there about the passion in Scotland, because the way everyone had been talking in the lead up, like on their side of how they'd all been talking in the lead up to the match was that, you know, they were really passionate. This was their moment. They'd come so far. They'd kind of got rid of the ghosts of the World Cup and like failing to qualify for the Euros. And I was watching them pitch and even like players you'd expect, like there was a couple of times where I turned to my friend and I was like, is Erin Cuthbert still on the pitch? I feel like I haven't seen her in ages. Like where, where is she? And like, they are the sort of players that I would have expected to be front and center all the time. Wash. Like, do you think it was the occasion that got to them? Do you think it was tiredness from the fact that they had to play the extra time against Austria last week? Or was it just one of those nights where things didn't click? I know you said about the midfield and obviously that was mentally, that was a massive thing for them, but it felt like there was more to it as well. I mean, it, I think it was a factor, but I, I just don't think anyone really set the tone for them. Um, No one put in that big crunch and tackle that would have kind of buoyed them to push on forward. And then mentally, I think they struggled after the penalty miss because you've got your best player stepping up and she hits it at a nice height for the keeper and you're kind of wondering, oh, was that the chance? And maybe that just got... Caroline Weir, I thought she was going to go top ends with it. <laughs> no. 
Poor, wasn't it though? Yeah. That was, wasn't a great it was penalty. A poor penalty, but a great save, like, but a poor penalty. She should be putting that away, player of her quality. Yeah, that's another one she's missed, a big one she's missed. So, mm-hmm. I mean, she's a very confident player. But I just think with Scotland, you know, it, it's a shame for them because we know, well, it's not really because we won, but <laughs> we know what it's like to underperform and to nearly yeah. get there. But the problem was, I think that they went into the game thinking they were going to win. They looked at our games which we deliberately played terrible because we wanted to le- draw the <laughs> <laughs> To be decision. quite honest, if I watched our games and studied them and analysed them, I'd go into a game thinking I was going to win because you can see where our weaknesses was. Well, we've been slow starters and we've invited pressure onto ourselves and you said that that would have been completely our downfall and this was probably the first game where we didn't do that, where we started our press that little bit higher and that little bit more aggressively. And it just it worked. This is this is another reason why I want to give Neil Fahi the player of the match because what I think what we really did differently is Neve went into midfield when that ball was played. We've never done that in any game. It was our problem against Sweden. They had far too much space in between our lines, our midfield and our defensive line. And when that ball got played into Kaz, uh, Caroline Weir, which is what they would have analysed and, and set up to do. Um, and she's very good at that, by the way. Neve was straight in there. As soon as that, they didn't even get to Caroline's feet and Neve Fahey was in there putting pressure on her along with Denise from the, the opposite way and gave her no space whatsoever. And that was it. They had nothing else. They didn't know how else to do it. They were trying to play wide, but then our wide players did really, really well and Jamie Finn and Megan Campbell. Um, and I just think everyone was top of their game, which we haven't seen in, in a very, very long time. It was. And... I also think we should give a word as well to Anya Gorman because it's her first competitive start since November. I was chatting to her earlier. She seemed buzzing and she was talking about how, you know, if she didn't play last night and Ireland lost, that was probably her opportunity to like get to the tournament gone. And that, you know, she was like, whenever I think back on that, and you'll have heard this at the start of the podcast, but whenever you think about that, it just kind of hits you how monumental it was. Karen, obviously... Well, obviously, you both know her quite well. Wash, what do you think a night like last night meant for her? I, I can't put it into words. I mean, like you say, it was probably re- retirement 2.0 on the cards if they hadn't gotten through. Um, but she came back and contributed to the squad in every way that she could. You know, she knows her role has kind of changed from that guaranteed starter um, to a person who's still very important to the squad because you need to have leaders throughout the squad and there's no one more professional. I've talked about the girls who've gone professional and made sacrifices. Anya has maintained those levels while working full time. She now has a family as well. And like just the added emotion of that and, and all that she's done. Um, and yeah, she's driven the standards for so long on and off the pitch, particularly off the pitch in recent years, um, that she deserves a night like that. God, I just wanted that header to go in. But well, I was going mean, to say, if, had like 50 if, she, people. <laughs> if she hadn't retired and we lost and she missed that header, I personally would have got her bags yeah. packed them, <laughs> and sent her on her way, being honest. And I told yeah. her that last night. Yeah. How? Oh. <laughs> I sent her after the game. I went, Anya, tell me you closed your eyes or something. And you know, Anya, she was like, I yeah. did. She did. Of course she did. <laughs> <laughs> Head went in like a turtle, but yeah, no, it's, again, just the work rate and the cover that she provided for the back line on a day that they needed it. Um, yeah, it's it's great for someone like Anya, who's, again, been through it all, seen it all. She's playing since she's 16. Like, yeah, the baby. She was the it, yeah. out and out baby, the team. You know, it's great. But you could see it in them. Anya, particularly Anya, didn't know what to do herself then after yeah. the game. She came over and she was like, I was like, Anya, you, you, got, you made it. She's like, yeah. And she was just like, <laughs> it's like she was shocked. I was like, you go on in there now. Relax yourself. You find yourself a cup of tea and have a little sit down. Yeah, no, I got onto her today and it was still like, I can't believe it. I don't know what to say. Right. She did seem, even today, she did still seem a bit shell-shocked. I was asking her questions and you know when someone is giving you an answer and you're like, I don't know if you're actually thinking about what you're saying. Not that she was saying anything bad, but it just seemed like she was in a bit of a daze and like, I can't believe I'm doing this. <laughs> but, and 
what is interesting about the squad is that we have so I mean we've talked about Nifa, we've talked about Anya Gorman. There are so many of these players who have slogged it out for a really long time, and this is like one of probably the last chances. I mean, some of them will probably keep going to the Euros if we qualified for that, but for a lot of them, this is probably like it's the tournament, it's the moment. And I think what I saw a lot last night was like those were the players who were constantly stepping up and showing I don't know there was just like a calmness or something about the team I know like on the pitch it was quite frantic but like there was one section towards the end where I think in 30 seconds Louise Quinn headed away like three different balls it was just like Scotland would just put one in she was just like nope back out again like Scotland would put another one she'd be like nope back out again oh, you're, you're saying that. Dashed up the pitch after a ball and I was like are you not dizzy after that like how are you still going you're saying that, but if they actually look back on the game, it could be one of the the easiest nights, the easiest yeah. games for them. I mean, I know, I think emotionally and just the importance of the game was intense and that. But looking back on it, they were solid. But I'm sure they can think of of more difficult games, you know, that they've played. Well, they rode their luck a lot more in other games. Like I'd say, shots on target. I mean, yeah, those exactly. shots that Courtney claimed were just looper balls in, and it's like one Cuthbert, one that was kind of straight at her in the second half. Other than that, she was unfazed, really. Yeah, exactly. And every time she fell on the ball, I was like, "You just lie down yeah. there for a little while now." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although when it came to the six minutes added time, I wasn't all that happy that there was so much time to go. <laughs> and obviously, last night was amazing. In this moment. I'm still struggling to really put it into words what it means, but just looking at the larger picture, I think the draw is on October 22nd. Obviously, we're going to go up the rankings now, which is good for in terms of like the Euro draw when it comes around. What, what if you're if we have someone listening now who isn't all that used to watching the team or maybe is just joining in for the first time? What does this win mean in terms of our standing in European and international football? Huge. It's massive. It's massive. Everybody bypasses the Republic of Ireland when they're talking about teams and playing against each other. Well, they talked about us. We're the team they didn't want to get as third place team. I mean, we're probably one of the best third place teams or just one of the worst to play against anyway. Now we've qualified. I think the performance last night for me was the most important thing because they played well. They they show they've shown that they can compete. They're better than Scotland, who have competed against really good teams like the Netherlands, for example. Nether uh, Scotland probably should have won that game. So you know that's a massive confidence thing. Plus, people watching, you know, we're a tiny, tiny country. You're talking about Irish, your your nation's own, uh, playing in a big, big world and and fantastic players, and also they're re- representing Ireland in in all of the clubs they're at. So you know that's a massive thing, and they need more support. They need that, and and you know I, what I'm finding recently. Um, is a lot of young girls want to watch football. They want to go and play football. So all of the guys, the dads, who have never been interested in women's football, and I'm talking about my friends, yes, you lot back there in League Slip, who have never come to watch me play. Did no one ever come to watch you no, play. I've never mentioned this before. <laughs> yes, you lot. Um, they have to be involved and they're interested because they want to support their 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 girls, their kids, and their boys obviously are going to be interested. Well, that, that's a big change. That's what's changing in, in the world of football in Ireland. I thought it was really nice today. I got two different taxis in and out to the hotel for the interviews. And neither of them I had said like what I was doing. So the first guy was just like sitting there and he was like, do you watch the match last night? And I was like, I didn't know which one he was talking about. And I was like, oh, I watched the women. And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. That was the only one in town. Had a great chat all the way out in the hotel. Mm-hmm. And then the other guy who picked me up, the exact same question. He was like, did you watch the Irish women last night? Wasn't that great? And I was like, oh, yeah, sure. Don't you know they're all just inside there? And he was like, are they? And I was like <laughs> rushing to get back for this. So uh, he was kind of like, oh, I'd love to go in. And I really wanted to say to him, like, just pull up and like go on in. And because everyone was just building around. And he was like, it'd just be so cool to see them. And he was saying he is friends with Jesse Stapleton's dad, I think, or something. And he was like, oh, just watching her grow up and play. It's just always so interesting. And it was just really nice to like have these casual conversations with people. And both of them were saying like, you know, 
probably didn't watch it all that much up until the last year or so. Yeah, yeah. Real, like people I haven't worked with in years and all sending texts being like, this is huge. And I think it is sinking in with a lot of people what, what the girls have done um, just based off other people who are contacting them to say, oh, did you see such and such? Did you see it? Like it's just filtered beyond the immediate football community. I mean, it's yeah. the national news yeah. Yeah. yeah and as well it's the support isn't it that they're getting like from Cadbury's from Sky all of these initiatives it's a massive thing yeah. and they're just becoming more visible and social media and the media are helping with that and you know they talk about us back in the day when we we fought our fought but actually no one really speaks about the media from back then and that's when well, that we- was the big change because the whole point of that was to get more training, better training. There's still a way to go in that, but what has changed is the amount of attention around the team. Yeah. And that's driven crowds and it's driven interest and column inches and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. That was That's the biggest change I saw. From- thank you. Thank you to the Irish media. We've never said thank you, thank yeah, you. No, no, seriously. <laughs> we'll make sure to send a white paper around thanking them all on a little envelope. Yeah. <laughs> and Karen, to like jump on this bandwagon, People want to watch more women's football. We obviously have a great league here. When can people next catch these players that were Sunday. won the World Cup <laughs> qualifier last night? Where do they go? What do they do? League. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hopefully they'll all be recovered in time. But like, again, there's Women's National League on Saturday. And like, say, P. Man United, we're playing in Turner's Cross. Great venue. Cork people, very proud footballing community they've just gotten promoted in the the men's side Denise O'Sullivan should be given freedom of the city I mean <laughs> that's that's sh- there should be a crowd in Turner's Cross I mean it's it's so easy to just pop down there and um, got games and it's actually a really exciting lead in to the end of this season so again if we get the interest for these last three games and you kind of show people what's going on here and the excitement and the buy-in that they can get by just paying a fiver into the a club that's down the road that you can get easy parking in and it's a really nice atmosphere around a real family event then that will help grow it for next year and that that's the big thing is a lot of people are saying oh do you think the league will go semi-pro now the league will go semi-pro now and I think there's a lot of work that needs to go into that but you've got ministers talking about more backing being needed in the women's game you'd wonder what pressure that's going to put on clubs and the, just the structures in the league altogether. but in terms of where they can just go and watch LOI TV free for anyone to watch Women's National League or just get out and support the girls and meet some of the heroes who've gotten us to a World Cup and Did possibly well. and break into the squad between now and then I mean there's a lot of young up and coming talent that hasn't been spoken about and it's hard to even think about the squad that's that just qualified changing yeah. for a World Cup but that's the nature of international football I mean that's the knock-on effect isn't it we're talking about how great it is they've qualified and how the girls are and how you know what it means but what it means it's going to motivate and it's Don't going to people, yeah. yeah like even Jessu Jessu last night I just dropped her a message look you'll be ready for the World mm-hmm. Cup. And she's like, yeah, that's it. Fingers crossed. So just motivation for players, whether they're injured, whether they're younger players looking on, just to get involved and to keep going and to push themselves a little bit further. Mm-hmm. And, and they can go and they can be professional footballers or or whatever, or stay in the game. So yeah, it's a, it's a massive, massive thing. That's the thing as well, because it is a year away. A lot can change in the space of a year. You know, you don't know who's going to get injured. You don't know whose form is going to change. We, it's that weird thing when you qualify that, like, I look at the team last night and I'm like, oh, they're all going to be there next year. But like, we don't know. Are they? Mm, And someone, Mm. like, there's plenty of young players in there who could break into the squad. And as you say, Karen, they're all, a lot of them are playing in the Women's National League. Is there any early shouts for people that you think might? Ooh. might start breaking into that squad oh. um, okay. or at least will be on Vera's radar for the I next. mean you already mentioned Jessie Stapleton she's probably one of the standout young players um, I'm sure Kiva Keenan after being drafted into this squad will be very motivated to try and keep that place I from day in day out who I see in P Man United um, Aaron McLaughlin has put an unbelievable stamp on the league this year Um 
and six months growth with more home-based sessions for someone like her would be a uh, huge similar Taro Hanlon they're all superstars it's just how much experience can you get into them between now and then and getting that balance right because we've spoken about how much and how valuable the experience was on the pitch last night and getting us over the line so it's striking the balance between introducing these young exciting players and making sure they understand how we play because like you say it wasn't pretty at times but it was damn effective <laughs> or I wonder how many Irish grannies great great grannies oh, are going to be crawling out of the woodwork <laughs> <laughs> exactly I was actually reading a thing this morning of um the amount of foreign base players that Vera has given her uh, her has given their debuts. I think there's been five in recent times. So I'd say watch that space for some more as well. But at the end of the day, you still want to go to the World Cup and you want to compete. You can't be overly you know, nostalgic about things. You want the best squad there who can actually put a stamp on the World Cup. So Beer is going to be on the lookout for the best players wherever they come from, whether it's players who are already there players who might come out of the woodwork or the granny rule or young players coming through. <laughs> it is great as well having a squad with depth and the fact that we can have these conversations and be like, well, we don't know. We might be there next year. Like there are all these up and coming players. Emma, in terms of, I know it is very, very far away, but in terms of the draw that's coming up, what what would you like for a group for Ireland? England. <laughs> we'll say England we want England I'd say England and a home nation so that they can get the crowd so I want England and Spain and Australia they're up to Swanee lately <laughs> <laughs> we are giving us a, an easy ride <laughs> I heard someone say today that one of the well like worst possible in terms of like top ranked teams we could get is like the US and Brazil which would be kind of interesting I have no idea how we'd play against either of those sides <laughs> It's, Not in a, like I don't know how we do it, as in just I have same as we always do five four one. Yeah. <laughs> we're actually better against physical teams. Like we don't want Brazil. We don't want those. We don't want Japan. Teams. No, we don't want Japan. Those running around us, <laughs> running on your legs. I actually do. I would love. I would love to get England. It's the perfect yeah. draw. I'd I love it. England. We've and never and played it. them. I mean, not in our generation, anyway. Never. Why not? It's a, such a strange thing. Would you settle for like if they came over and did like say a friendly before the World Cup or something? You know, yeah, friendly about it, but yeah, let's get it on in the event. Let's go. No friendlies. <laughs> Should we start the petition now and hopefully like get a bit of traction on uh, it? Oh, you can be you... sure you could you could be sure they wouldn't be coming to Ireland. No. We'll they'll host. They'll host ever so kindly. <laughs> but I would. I'd love. I wouldn't mind Germany either. To be honest, looking at the Euros, I mean that's where my bitterness kind of comes from when I watch these big tournaments and I just think of Ireland, we could be there, we could compete against these players. And I'm, when I'm looking at them, I'm always thinking of the Irish team, always, like I just can't switch off. And I think that's where my bitterness comes from because I'm like, oh, we should be there. So looking at it this year, I'm like, we can compete against them. We could compete against all of those teams that were in the Euros, I think, personally, if we don't sit back and park a bus. But that's that's the thing, if you took like our qualifying process for this World Cup and like transferred that into say like a Euros group stage or something, you know, Sweet. we would have done quite well. And really well. It, I mean, we've, we were moaning, weren't we, Karen? We were moaning about them and how they play, but actually the results have been pretty good. It's been unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all you look at at the end of the day. Yeah. That's what, that's what you're allowed to. I mean, when you're sitting there watching them, if you can't moan about the way they're playing and then enjoy the results at the end. <laughs> You're not doing the spectator. That's what we're that. here for. We're here to whinge and cry. <laughs> and all of the other range of emotions we've had over the last 12 hours. Mm. It is though, like every, when you look at it, it's like what, only 11 teams that qualify from Europe. If you look at the top 20 teams in the world, the majority of them come from Europe. It's the hardest qualification process. And I mean, we cleared it. Iceland, like the friendlies we played against Iceland were hard to watch. I mean, they absolutely dominated, but the progress since then, now Iceland are out and we're through. It was an insane turnaround. Yeah. Portugal are on the up as well. Just give them a little shout out. They were you very did say it from Euros. early days, even during the Euros, Karen and Portugal mm, were one of those teams. watching them. Yeah. And a great performance for them last night. I mean, they were completely dominant. And actually a team I would love to see, considering, because they're not, 
all that dissimilar to ourselves in terms of the league setup that they have. I think there's a semi-pro though. I think they already are semi-pro, but a lot of the players, you know, they are like our players who have normal day jobs that aren't being a footballer. So for their sake, I'm always happy to see another small nation do well. As long as we don't get drawn against them or something and they beat us, (laughs) any of that sort of crap. We don't want that. And now that we have reached this moment, we've, We've achieved it. We've talked about it. Qualifying for a major tournament has literally been the thing that everyone has talked about for a couple Forever. of decades now. Like Forever. it's not, yeah. Forever. It's not even years. How how do you keep yourself motivated in that, I suppose? Because there must be like a tiny bit of a I, I don't know if slump is the right word afterwards, but when you've worked and worked and worked and worked towards something and now you're like, oh, we have actually achieved it. Now we need to pull ourselves together for a different amazing mentality. beaches. There are amazing beaches in Australia and New Zealand. I'm hitting the gym. Oh, same. I just really I'm not even playing. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a massive motivator for these players. Now they have the chance to compete and and they have they have to put their money where their mouth is because we've been moaning about not getting through and we've been moaning about them for the last two years like not playing to their best ability and I've been listening to the players saying yeah but nobody looks at the Irish because we don't get to big tournaments nobody pays the Irish big contracts because we don't get to big turn now's the chance now's your time and you've got a year to get yourself as physically fit as possible uh, which they've worked on a lot. Like you can see, they're they're athletes now. Mm. Um, and to play at the highest level as possible as well. Um, and we and don't then- want to be a one-hit wonder. So even outside of the players, it needs to be consistent now that we're constantly qualifying for these tournaments. And that means that's the wider conversation then getting a bit more businesses involved in the clubs, like helping the clubs to get bigger sponsors so that they can train more often and get to that semi-pro. I mean, that should be doable. I mean, we were a few years ago, we were like, God, wouldn't it be great if we could emulate the Scots and what they've done with their league. And now we're beating their international team, but our league isn't there. So maybe it's not going to be consistent. I have to tell you, you might as well forget about the league because if these players play well at that stage, none of them will be playing in Ireland. They'll all be taken over to England. They'll all be contracted and you cannot blame them for leaving and going. But that's the thing. They're going to go and then there'll be a void left in Ireland and the league will lose kind of any bit of traction. The quality won't be there. So you have to have a certain base the whole way through to feed into these leagues and it just needs to be a bit more of a conveyor belt of them. So, yeah, that's... Win, 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 lose, win, lose situation. Yeah. And I suppose with these things, there's always going to be the downsides to a certain extent. But also, I I get what you're saying, Karen, in terms of like, if there is more of a base there, if there is more of an opportunity, like not every player as well is going to want to go fully pro and move over to England. I'm just looking at the younger girls. Can we get the younger girls on maybe like centralized contracts until they're fully ready to go and they're ready to go to a good league and they're ready to go to the WSL where they're not going to second division across Europe in countries that we're actually better than. Absolutely. Centralized contracts and an academy that they they go to and they train and they get specific training and and the highest top quality training is the only way you're going to improve these players and keep them in Ireland. And for to wrap up with both of your final thoughts on last night, today, the next year. I mean, obviously, Koi Giga is going to be continuing to cover all this sort of stuff. Thankfully, we have qualified, so that means we have plenty more to talk about for the next year about this Irish team. But I want to leave the final word to you both as players who have been through it all. And I am just a mere spectator in the whole thing. <laughs> oh, God, I think I'm out of words. I am... Um... I mean, I, I can't, I couldn't articulate last night. I couldn't articulate this morning. Yeah, it's just incredible. It, I, it's just, it's been an absolute emotional roller coaster for the last 24 hours for me. And I feel like I'm, I'm so proud of them. Yeah. And it's hard. It's hard as well because you want to be a part of it as well. You've worked so hard to get where they are now. 
But um, it's just fantastic to see. And I just feel finally, that's all I'm replying to everyone. When someone's texting me, I just keep replying, finally, explanation mark, explanation mark. Oh, I'm copying and pasting to every single person. (laughs) I've renamed my dog. (laughs) Who hates me. (laughs) I've renamed Saki Amber. This is my little ginger fox in the box. So (laughs) I'm sure she would be pretty happy with that one. I have to say, having (laughs) touched her a few times before. Well, thank you both for that. And I'm sorry to make you relive parts of last night that I know were were difficult, (laughs) but I think it was well worth it for the podcast, well worth it for the content. Uh, The Coyote Pod and OTB Sports is an association with Cadbury FC, official snap partner to the Republic of Ireland women's national team. Just a reminder as well that we are still running our competition to support grassroots football. Um, We are giving away all the net profits from our most recent Cadbury Roadshow in Vicker Street, which the lovely Emma was on. And you can catch a few clips of that on YouTube if you so wish. Um, So we'll be giving you the opportunity to win 1,000 euro worth of equipment for your local grassroots adult club. And I mean, after everything we've been talking about, after the fact that we've just qualified for a World Cup, what better time to get some money into your club and keep women's Irish women's football raging in all the good ways so for your club to be in with a chance to win contact us with your club details and club and contact information at the koi gig pod at off the ball.com terms and conditions apply head over to otvsports.com for more that's it for this week's podcast but we will be back next week because despite what we may feel there is actually other football happening in the world. Um, the WSL is back this weekend, so you get a day or two to catch your breath. And uh, then- we'll watch that from Coppers next weekend. <laughs> we'll still be celebrating. <laughs> Genuinely looked up the street towards Coppers last night when I came out of the pub and I was like, hmm, Koi gig? <laughs> we were all in the same place. It would have been a great if it wasn't a Tuesday as well. Um, but we will see you all next week for that. The Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports in association with Cadbury. A player and a half deserves a glass and a half of support.